So that's really how you can identify those people that are interesting from your perspective. And then one trick that you can use is send a contextually valid message. What do I mean with a contextually valid message? If I go back two slides or a couple of more actually, you can see that you orient yourself based on information you already have. So if I send you a message and that message originates from someone you are linked to on LinkedIn, for example, then it's pretty common that you would accept that message, message as being valid. And um, I could put something in there that sounds usual for that person, and I could possibly convince you to take certain actions. So that's really what I mean with a contextually valid message. So this is a sample of the methodology that is today commonly used for these targeted attacks. If you read the documentation uh, that is now widely available on the, the US um, uh, Defense Department compromises that re recently happened because there have been a couple of public hearings on it, you can hear that most of these attacks took place by an attacker, in this case my favorite little beast, the demon, who compromises a server, then sends an email to the victim. The victim opens the email, um, essentially, at that time, he opens an attachment, that code executes, the code connects to another compromised server, and then that compromised server is able to access data. Now, I know this is a very easy and simple representation of what is happening, and that in reality, it's a, a little bit more complex, but this is really very common to what happens today. In some cases, this is more complex because the victim is, for example, based in a company and you need to take into account proxy servers or you need to take into account other controls. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. Um, this is a s somewhat of an explanation of what these attachments usually consist of. Most of the times in the recent past, these attachments have been um, exploiting certain application file parsing vulnerabilities. Why file parsing vulnerabilities? Uh, well, the time that you could send someone an attachment and it would auto-execute because they were running a really old version of Outlook Express, those times are really gone. That just doesn't happen anymore. You can still send people executables, but most companies actually filter executables, or at least should filter executables, because for one or the other reason, every time one of these uh, XA email uh, worms breaks loose, there's still a lot of people that get infected, which is a, a bit difficult to believe, but it still happens. So a new thing really is uh, we all have to run application software on our machines. We run Microsoft Word, we run uh, Ichitaro, which is a Japanese word processor. We run, for example, an archiving utility such as WinRAR. And we need to do something with files when we get them. So, for example, someone sends a Word document to me. Uh, I double-click on the Word document. Microsoft Word actually opens it, but we all know that um, no application is really completely foolproof. All applications have some security vulnerabilities, and especially with the recent rise in te techniques such as fuzzing, these, uh, these vulnerabilities are, are relatively commonly found. And there have been a lot of instances in which there were uh, stack or heap overflows in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Ichitaro, WinRAR, and many other applications which could be exploited to actually execute code on a system. So generally, these files then consist of something to actually trigger the vulnerability and exploit it, then some shell code that takes action, that takes control over the system uh, upon execution. And then generally, these files, uh, because they are pretty large, a Word document, when you get a Word document of 5, 600 case, you, you're not really very suspicious because it happens quite often. Word documents contain images. Those images are also included in the total file size because in the end, a Word document is really just an OLE container that can contain contain a lot of different other objects. So it doesn't really hurt if we put an executable into that Word document and we use the shell code to actually extract that executable, run it on the system. So in essence, you have a couple of components. You have the little piece of, of string, actually, that exploits a vulnerability. You have the shell code that takes action or control over the system. And then you have an executable, which is, in fact, the Trojan. Um, there are also some other methodologies in which there isn't really an executable embedded, but just shellcode that connects to a remote server, downloads an executable, and then runs it. That exists as well, but uh, that mainly happens when you have files that are generally smaller and when you would get, for example, a one megabyte uh, HTML file. That's a bit suspicious, isn't it? Um, now, in 2005, it actually broke loose, this, uh, this piece of news. The NISCC, which, is in the which has in the meanwhile been renamed to CPNI, uh, Critical um, 
Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure in the UK, and in the US, US CERT, they both released warnings which really warned of targeted Trojan email attacks. At the time, this mentioned that the attacker's aim appears to be covert gathering and, transmit and transmitting of commercially or economically valuable information. The US CERT uh, bulletin was really uh, a carbon copy of the NICC bulletin. It was also mirrored by the Canadian uh, organization responsible for information security and also by uh, DSD in Australia, for example. So this really gave an impression there's something happening here and we need to be careful. Um, now, I'm going to introduce one target today. Um, I know when you read the description of the talk, you may have thought, oh, finally we're going to find out who broke into the, uh, to Merkel's uh, home computer, but unfortunately that will not be for today's talk, maybe next year. Today we'll be looking at another target, a target that we can use a little bit more openly because it's actually fairly known that they've been attacked, but the details haven't been known up until today. And this target is the Falun Gong. Now, could I see some hands here from everyone who knows what the Falun Gong is? Okay, so that's about 50% of the room. That's better than I expected. The Falun Gong is really um, a system of mind and body cultivation that, uh, that was actually started um, in China by Li Hongzi. My apologies for the uh, Chinese pronunciation. I know that it's worthless, but... Um, it was started in 1992, and it consists of five sets of meditation exercises, which are commonly referred to as Falun Gong, and then also, in addition, as sets of religious teachings, which are commonly referred to as Falun Dafa. Now, this movement, the uh, religious movement, really, around it is now also commonly re referred to as, as Falun Gong, so the terminology is a little bit used, um, used in, well, intermingledly. Um, this organization has really been repressed by the People's Republic of China dating back to 1999, and the reason for this is because at that point in time, uh, a couple of weeks before this happened, um, an article appeared in, uh, in a Chinese magazine, which I believe is called Reader's Youth. And this magazine article actually said that practicing Qigong, which is really where Falun Gong comes from, uh, sort of breathing exercises and, and physical exercises, that Qigong, uh, or the, the execution of Qigong, wasn't really very useful for youth uh, and health development of youth. So, um, and the article also had a very critical tone of the Falun Gong movement and said that it actually wasn't uh, useful and, and that it really didn't have much use. So uh, at that point in time, there was some mild protest from the Falun Gong community, after which a couple of people were arrested. And uh, then shortly after that, this happened. The Falun Gong actually managed to get many, many thousands of people to protest in front of the uh, Chinese government headquarters in 1999. And um, this actually caused the Falun Gong to be banned by the People's Republic of China. The reasons that they named were because it was uh, supposedly a threat to social and political stability of the country. And, because, and afterwards they really detained thousands of, uh, of individual practitioners. Now ever since that ban by the People's Republic of China has been heavily criticized by human rights activists. And also, which is a little bit in the sidelines, there's also been somewhat of an information war going on between China and the Falun Gong. To just name one example, in 2002, um, some Falun Gong practitioners from Taiwan supposedly uh, were able to, to actually hack the uplink of the Sinosat satellite in uh, the Chinese television satellite, and they were able to interrupt television programming and actually send their own television programming to the satellite, which could then be received in, in most of China. Now, this was a, a bit of a problem for China. Afterwards, they even launched Sinosat-2, which is the second satellite, and that actually had protection against this type of, uh, of satellite hijacking. But um, that's not everything. In the, just in the sidelines, there's also been reports stating back to 2003 by Falun Gong practitioners that they received email viruses. And that was a bit interesting. So early this year, I decided to look into that a little bit more and uh, got in touch with some of these people, got some samples of, of malware. And these actually very much interlink with what we've been hearing of, of the, the targeted attacks that have been reported from other organizations. Once again, there's nothing known really about the source of these samples, but it's, it's just an interesting fact that it's been happening there as well. Now, from April to October 2007, um, there was a total of 26 total incidents, in, to which I'll go into a little bit more depth uh, later. 
So this is really the Falun Gong. Uh, this, uh, in 1999, just before they were banned, all the people lining up in, in really what was a relatively peaceful protest in front of the Chinese government headquarters. Now, it actually all started in 2005 with screensaver objects. Now, I don't know whether you remember this, but a couple of years ago, it was really common to uh, send a virus mimicked as a screensaver. And the reason for this is because a Windows screensaver, what we know as .scr files, are in fact executables. They just have a different extension, and you can load them as, as screensavers. But in fact, they're just executables. And this was actually one of the first attacks that, that, that I received a copy of, and it was a, an executable that was called .scr, and it was attached to an email. And when you opened it, you saw something like this, and it continuously uh, moved around, and, and um, other things happened on the screen. Fairly b benign texts, mostly. Now, if you look in the, in the file, you can see that it's just a, a program. You can see that uh, DOS stud executable there. Um, just to give a small introduction, um, when you load a, an executable on Windows, most executables actually contain a stub executable at front. The reason for this is so that if you run it on, on older versions or on command line and you use a different loader for the executable, and then it just shows you that the program cannot be run in DOS mode. Now, at the time, they weren't really very inventive in choosing host names for their control service because at the time, the host name was just faleninfo.3322.org which was uh, kind of funny if you're trying to do a below-the-ocean the, um, below um, targeted attack, isn't it? That uh, piece of code then connected to a machine on port 80, and that machine was actually granted full access to the compromised host um, in the return connection. So the host actually made an outbound connection, and that connection was then used. The remote server could connect to the, uh, to the infected machine and then execute code. Now, um, one th a thing that was very interesting and became obvious also at that time was something that I've come to call domain parking. Now, I haven't seen this described anywhere else, so I don't know whether there's a better term for it. Um, but it, it sounds a little bit like parking because it's used when you compromise a machine to temporarily shut down the attack and afterwards restart it when you need further information. The thing really is that uh, these types of attacks, they do a DNS lookup for, first. So in this case, the code does a DNS lookup for faleninfo.3322.org, and then it gets back an IP address, and it then builds a connection to that IP address. Now, the problem with this attack is that once the uh, hostname resolves and the outbound connections take place, you can see this in your firewall logs. So it's a bit of a, a noisy attack, and once it's running, you can easily identify which machines have been infected if, if you know the host name by looking at your firewall logs or if you know the IP address. So one technique that became common was actually to change the response um, at the points in time where collection wasn't really necessary. So suppose you need information, then you resolve the IP address. If you don't need information, then you resolve it too. Anyone who knows the answer? localhost, 127001, because in that case you don't have the outbound connection and you only have the DNS query. And could I see some hands here of everyone who logs every single DNS query in his company? Nothing? I tried doing it once for a very small company, but when the name server crashed, when the, the log file was two gigabytes and I didn't turn up ro uh, rotation, I, I just turned it off. <laughs> but anyway, localhost is indeed an, an IP address. If you resolve to this, then the connection will actually go to the loopback interface, and in essence, nothing will happen. So this was a technique that they could use to temporarily stop the attack and reactivate it later. So the advantage was you could infect a couple of people by infecting their machines, and then afterwards the machines, when you needed information from them, you resolved the IP address, the machines connected back to you, and you could get information when you wanted. And in the meanwhile, it was very difficult to discover this, especially if you take into account that these emails were usually only sent to 10, 15, 20 people, and not much more, so uh, then, then you know it won't get to an antivirus vendor. Now, um, there are two ways to identifying parking after the facts have occurred, because this was a bit of a problem for me. I had these samples that were dated back to, uh, dating back to 2005 and 2006, but how could I identify whether they were ever parked, whether the, the control service changed? Well, there are really two ways to do this. One way actually looks at the future, that's DNS Watch. DNS Watch is a really nice script that was written by someone whose name unfortunately slips my mind, but look on Google for DNS Watch. And what the script actually does, it just does a DNS lookup every 10 minutes and it registers when an, a host name has changed, 
IP address. This is actually from an ongoing attack, which is still taking place today. So this is an actual host name. Um, and you can see on the 21st, 23rd, and 24th of December, when you see a plus, it means that the hostname is now resolving to that IP address, and a minus means that it's no longer resolving to that IP address. Now, it's interesting to know that the 